everything that is alive and has mind, we women are the most wretched creatures. First of all, we have to buy a husband with a vast outlay of money. We have to take a master for our body. The later is still more painful than the former. And here lies the most critical issue, whether we take a good husband or a bad. For divorce brings shame on a woman's reputation, and we cannot refuse a husband his rights. We come to new ways of behaviour, to new customs, and, since we have learned nothing of such matters at home, we need prophetic powers to tell us specifically what sort of husband we shall have to deal with. And if we manage this well, and our husband lives with us and bears the yoke of marriage lightly, then life is enviable. But if not, death would be welcome. As for man, when he has had enough of life at home, he can stop his heart sickness by going out to see one of his friends or contemporaries. But we are forced to look one soul alone. Men say of us that we live a life free from danger at home while they fight wars. How wrong they are. I would rather stand three times in the battle line than bear one child. If I can find some means, some schemes to take just revenge for these evils on my husband and the man who gave his daughter to him and that daughter whom he married, I ask you to keep silence. In all other respects, a woman is full of fear and proves a coward at the sight of iron in the fight. But when she is wronged in her marriage bed, no creature has a mind more murderous. It looks as if you're going to make a nuisance of yourself, women. I shall go into exile. It's not this that I am supplicating you to grant me. Why then are you being so aggressive? Allow me to stay this one day to think out how I can best go into exile and find a haven for my children since their father does not trouble himself to make any plans for them, but pity them. You too are a father. You have children. You are likely to be sympathetic to mine. I take no thought to my situation should we be exiled, but I weep for them, the victims of ill fortune. I am far from tyrannical by temperament, and by shell and mercy, I have often come to grief. And now too, I can see that I am making a mistake with it, but nevertheless, you will have what you ask for. But I tell you this, this son God's life tomorrow, you shall be uphold you and your children within the boundaries of this land, you shall die. This is my final word, I mean what I say. But now, if you must remain, stay for a single day, since you won't be able to do any terrible things which frighten you. Though it was impossible for him to thwart my plots by throwing me out of the land, he has granted me this one day to stay here, a day in which I shall make the three of my enemies corpses, the father, the daughter, and my husband. One of the many possible ways I have to kill them, I do not know what will be my first choice, my friends. Shall I set fire to the bridal house, or go silently into the room, where their bridal bed is laid, and drive a sharpened sword through their hearts? For there is one thing that is against me. If I am caught as I enter the room to carry out my plot, I shall be killed and give my enemies the last laugh. It is best to take direct route. Here I am the supreme expert, and kill them with poison. But if misfortune is to drive me out, my plot's frustrated, I shall myself take a sword, even if I am going to die, and I shall kill them. I shall proceed to an act of ruthless daring, for never I swear by the mistress where my revere above all gods and have chosen as my co-worker, Hecate who dwells in a recess of my heart, never shall any one of them grieve my heart and smile to see it. As far as I personally am concerned, you can go on forever saying that Jason is an utter scoundrel. But as for what you have said against the royal family, you should consider it all game that you are being punished simply with exile. For my part, when their majesty's passions were roused, I always did my best to calm them, and I wanted you to stay. But you would not moderate your foolish behavior, and always spoke badly of them. And so you will be banished from the land. Violence of traitors, yes, I can at least call you that. The most cutting insult against a man who is no man. So you have come to us to have you bitterest of enemies to us, to the gods, to me, and the whole human race. It is not boldness or courage when one hurts one's friends and looks them in the face, but the greatest of all human sicknesses, shamelessness. You have done well to come, since I shall relieve my feelings by denouncing you, and you will grieve to hear me. Where can I turn now? To my father's house? Have I betrayed it, my fatherland too, when I followed you here? Or to the wretched daughters of Helias? How warmly they would welcome me in their house. I killed their father. If I am to be flung out of this land into exile, bereft of friends, my children, myself, all, all alone, a final reproach to the newly married man, that his children and I, who saved you, should wander around a begging. O Zeus, why have you given men clear ways to recognise what gold is counterfeit? 
but on the body put no stamp by which one should distinguish a bad man. I considered it was Aphrodite, but it would be invidious to spell out how love forced you with his inescapable arrows to save me. You helped me, and I am pleased with the result. However, by saving me, you took more than you gave. The human race should produce children from some other source, and the female sex should not exist. Then mankind would be free from every evil. Do not then make a show of generous behaviour towards me with your skillful speaking. One word will lay you flat. If you have not been a bad man, you should have talked me round before making this marriage, not done it without your loved one's knowledge. Yes, I would have had your full backing for this plan. Go on insulting me. Enough. I shall not discuss these matters with you any further. Off with you. Go with your marriage. Perhaps with God's help it will be said. This will prove the kind of match which will bring you tears. My dear, greetings. And greetings to you too, it is. From where have you come? I'm on my way back from the ancient oracle of Phoebus. I wanted to know how I could beget offspring. I'm childless by the stroke of some divine power. I'm not unmarried. I'm paired with a wife. His words were too clever for a mere man to interpret, for a clever brain is certainly needed. I wish you well and hope you may with all your desire. Aegeus, I have the worst of all husbands. Jason wrongs me, though I did him with no harm. He has a woman who supplants me as a mistress of his house. Creon, who rules this land of Corinth, is driving me into exile. And does Jason consent? He says he doesn't, but I beg you with by this your beard and your knees. Now I am your suppliant. Pity, pity me in my wretchedness, and do not look on as I go into desolate exile. Thus receive me in your country at the heart of your palace. So may your desire for children, with the gods' help, find fulfillment, and may you come to death a happy man. You do not know what a godsend you have found here in me. I shall put an end to your childlessness. Through me you will beget children. I know the medicines for this. For many reasons, lady, I am eager to grant you this favour. First, because of the gods, then of the children whose birth you promised me. If you come to my palace yourself, you will stay there safe from harm, and I shall not hand you over to anyone. Excellent. Swear by the land of the earth and the father of my father, the sun. I swear by the earth and the sun's bright light, and all the gods to abide by the words I hear you utter. Go on your way, and good luck go with you. Now I shall tell you all my plans. I shall send one of my servants to Jason to ask him to come and see me. When he arrives, I shall speak soft words to him, saying that I approve of the marriage he has made to the princess. I shall ask him to let my children stay, not that I would leave my children in a hostile country for my enemies to insult. My purpose is to kill the king's daughter with trickery, for I shall send the children, holding gifts in their hands, a delicate robe and a golden garland. If she takes these adornments and puts them on her flesh, she will die horribly. With such drugs I anoint the gifts. I cry out when I think what kind of deed I must do afterwards. I shall kill the children, my own ones. Let no one think of me as weak and submissive, but as a woman of a very different kind, dangerous to my enemies and good to my friends. I have come as you told me to. Jason, I beg you to pardon what I said before. I was being very foolish and that my rage was needless. I ask you for your goodwill and admit that I viewed the business wrongly before, but now have come to see it with better judgment. How quick I am to weep, unhappy woman, and how full of fear. At last I have brought out a quarrel with your father to an act. I approve of what you say, woman, and I find no fault with your former attitude either. I'm thinking about these children. But you must beg Crayon that our children should not go into exile from this country so that they can receive their education at your hands. I do not know whether I am likely to persuade him, but I must try. I too shall give you assistance in this task. I shall send the children to her bearing gifts which I know are most beautiful in the world by far. A delicate robe and a golden garland. Let one of the servants bring the adornments here as quickly as possible. She will win not one, but countless blessings. In you she has gained the best of men as her husband, and she has received the adornments which once the son, the father of my father, gave to his children. Why, foolish woman, are you emptying your own hands of these things? Do you really think that the royal palace is in need of robes or of gold? Keep them, do not give them away. If my wife values me at all, I am confident that she will put me before mere possession. No, no. They say that gifts persuade even the gods. It is vital that she takes these gifts into her hands. Oh, what misery my willfulness is bringing me. It was vain then, my children, that I nursed you, in vain that I toiled for you, and wore myself down with the stain, the earned the birth pangs that I endured. Many indeed were the hopes that I, poor fool, placed in you once. 
I trusted that you would care for me in my old age, that your hands would wrap my body securely in my shroud when I die. Ah, uh, ah, uh, do not, my heart, do not do this. Let them be, poor heart. Spare the children. Alive with us in Athens, they will make you happy. By avenging fiends below in Hades, it will never come to pass that I leave my children from enemies to insult. There is no alternative. They must die. And since they must, I who gave them birth shall kill them. I can no longer look upon you, but I am overwhelmed by the evils which surround me. And I know that evil deeds that I am about to do, but my fury against Jason is stronger than my counsels of softness. And it is fury that leads to the greatest evils of mankind. My friends, I have long been waiting to find out what has happened. Your two children arrived with their father and entered the bride's home. When she saw the adornments, she could not resist, but promised her husband all he asked. And before your boys and their father had gone from the house, she took the finely woven robe and put it on, placing the golden garland around her curls. She arranged her hair as she looked in a shining mirror, laughing at the lifeless picture of her body. But what came next was a fearful sight to behold. She changed colour and staggered back sideways, her limbs trembling, and just managed to collapse on the throne. Her flesh melted from her bones, like teardrops of resin as your poison gnawed invisibly. Everyone was afraid to touch the corpse. At once, Creon cried out in his grief, threw his hands around her and kissed her. Suddenly, he fell back. He pulled violently at his own skin. He kept tearing his old flesh from his bones. But after time, the flame of his life was extinguished and the ill-fated man breathed out his spirit. I have long thought that man's life is merely a shadow. I should not fear to say that those who seem to be wise as they anxiously ponder their words of wisdom and convict themselves of the greatest folly. My friends, I have now decided what to do. Come, my cruel hand, take the sword. Do not think how very much you love your children. Forget your feelings for them in this one brief day and then the men. <coughs> Under the bolts with all speed, attendants. Release the fastening so that I can see disaster. Those two children dead. <laughs> you lonesome creature. I wish I had never begot them. My poor children. To see them slaughtered by you. <laughs>